Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to our reading of Juz 12, um, inshallah ta'ala. Um, I just like to, um, feeling a little bit under the weather today. So if today's a shorter session or if it's not my usual exuberant self, then I do uh, beg your forgiveness, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and hopefully by tomorrow things will be better and uh, more, I don't know, interactive or whatever else. Um, the surah that we're looking at at the beginning will be Surah Hud. And Surah Hud, there's a few themes and ideas that are very important, primarily because of the hadith of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where when the Sahaba noticed that he had some white hairs, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Shayyabatni Hud wa khawatuha, who then her sisters, as in her partner surahs, who talk about the same topics and concepts and ideas, have whitened my hair. And so the ideas and stories covered in this surah which is about the responsibilities of prophets, uh, about the Day of Judgment, about um, steadfastness and other things. And we'll look at some a, a specific verse that has um, a very important message uh, with regards to this surah, inshallah ta'ala, over this session later. But the surah starts... Um, Alif Lam Ra Kitabu Nuhkimatayatu Thumma Fusilat min Ledun Hakim al Khabir. And that's at the close of Juz eleven. The last page of Juz eleven in the uh, Indian print of the Quran closes with uh, with this opening of Surah Hud. And then the Juz Juz twelve starts with this idea of the animals, uh, that all animals, all creation depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for their sustenance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about where they go and what they do, and everything is in the clear book. And there's going to be a lot of um, discussion about, um, in this early part, of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a Makki surah, this carries strong connotations of dealing with a Makkan audience. And so the Qur'an starts this surah, a juz, sorry, with, وَالَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَضَ فِي سِتَةِ أَيَّامِ He created all of creation in six days, and his throne is above the water. Um, and this idea of resurrection... Um, about and because the, the mushrikun denied resurrection, as we've mentioned before, um, and then Allah subhanahu wa taala talks about walayna daql al insana mirham minna rahma that if they taste some of the punishment, then we remove it. Uh, if they taste some of our mercy, and then we remove it. Like if there's good times, and then the good times re- uh, dissipate, they become incredibly despondent and denial and in- ungrateful for all of the blessings Allah subhanahu wa taala has given them. Um. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There's this challenge of the Quran, um, the, the the denial that the Mushrikun had that the Quran was the book of Allah subhanahu wa taala, uh, and this used to upset the Messenger of God sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So whatever they say, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is told, tell them to bring ten surahs like it. If the Quran is just made up and it's the product of human agency, then you can do this. This is this that means that this is something that can be. Imitated, in that case imitate it, bring 10 surahs and over time that threat or that challenge will become less and less in the sense that bring less, bring just a surah, bring just, and so this is how, uh, the, so the surah contains a verse which is one of the challenges of them to bring the Quran, and if you need help ask those gods that give you food to drink, uh, food to eat instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if it doesn't happen then know that this is the knowledge of God, this is the divine book, and that there is no God except Him. That He is the one God. Again, proofs of divine oneness. The, the Quran is the proof of Allah's existence as much as it is the proof of the prophethood of the Messenger of God. The breaking of the natural habit can only be done by the divine entity. Therefore, the Quran, all the miracles of the Prophet are one in one way or another, also a proof for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks again about the Quran, that you have to recite the book, about the Jews. Um, about the denial of the book, about making lies about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and if we move forward, um, it talks about people whose whole um, mindset is focused on the dunya. This is sort of around verses uh, eight, 17, 18, 19, that there are people whose whole life is bent, uh, spent with this focus on the dunya, and at the end, they're just going to give themselves destruction. They're going to lose. And in the Day of Judgment, they will be al akhsarun not just losers, but the greatest of all the losers, uh, except those people who believe in Allah and 
do the good actions and they're turning consistently to the Lord, these are the people of the paradise. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a beautiful verse about the two types of people. Comparing these groups is like comparing the dumb person who has no ability to speak and the blind person with the one who sees and hears everything. Are these two people the same? Do they not take heed from this? So this is the idea that the world is ultimately in two groups. One is the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who see the signs, who see everything as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then on the other side you have people who, who just see dunya, who just see dunya and they are like blind people. They are blind and that's why in a world, I saw this very nice tweet by uh, contentions from Sheikh Dhaqim Murad where he says that uh, the Dajjal will only be king in a world where everybody is blind because he's one-eyed. But if you have one eye, it's better than the person who has no eyes. So the, when the world is being is blind, then everybody will follow the Dajjal because he will be the most learned, most um, foresighted person in the world of blindness. The one man, you know, I can't remember there's a saying, in a world of the blind people, the guide is the one-eyed one, the one-eyed man is king or something, there's a saying. Um, and then we have these, in Surah Hud, we have these many stories of the Prophet. So we'll go through some of them uh, without getting into too much detail. And a lot of these surahs that are story type surahs, you can read them on your own um, and just sort of read the translation and you get a lot of the ideas, though you miss the, the, the uh, linguistic nuances. But we send Nuh to his people and he was a warner for them that worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, you're just a human being. And all of those people that follow you, they're the, like the weak and the decrepit of our people. So this is, you know, what's this all about? You know, why should we follow you? There's no honor in following you because only the weak of our community follow you. Um, and then he's, he's saying, Munuh alayhi salatu is saying, um, you know, I have the miracles, I have the guidance, I have the blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are blind to see. Um, and I don't even come, I'm not asking for money, I'm not asking for wealth, I'm not asking for anything else. All I'm asking um, is just for you to follow me. Um, and at some point you will meet your Lord. Who's going to help me? Um, who's going to help me with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I drive these people away? And so, um, and I'm not saying I have wealth and I'm not saying I know the unseen or, and I'm not saying I'm an angel. Um, all I'm saying is he's just, he's just a prophet of God, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so they don't like these arguments that he's making. They say, you've come to argue with us and this is just, so bring the punishment. And he says Allah will bring it when he wishes and you can't you can't escape this. This is no and um and so I can give you all the guidance if you choose not to follow it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he has do if he has destined that you will be punished, then this is the end. Um and so this carries on. Um and then he's told Nuh alayhi salam that the punishment is in, inevitable. build the ark in front of our eyes. Um and so in the the people will all be destroyed, they're all gonna drown. So he builds the ark and they're making fun of him now. Oh, ho, ho, la, look, you're making an ark. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you if you think it's funny, then watch how we make fun of you. The, the joke's on you. Soon you're going to know because when it comes, it will just destroy you. And then the Prophet Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wa is, is told that the flood is coming, everybody's going to be destroyed. So he has to take uh, uh, the, the, the two and the verses about, you know, embark on the ship. At this point, Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, his own son, uh, Sayyidina Nuh saying to his son, come, come with me, um, climb, you know, get on the ark and don't be with the disbelievers. And he says, I will go to the mountain. The mountain will protect me from the water. He, he rejects the revelation for the material. He rejects the real for the physical. And then the Sayyidina Nuh is saying, there is no protection today except, from, except those who Allah shows his mercy. Mercy is the only thing that is going to save anybody. And ultimately, Sayyidina Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam, his beloved son, who he was unable to save. And sometimes that's the nature of the world. You're unable to save those you love because Allah has already made a decision and Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam's son is uh, destroyed. Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam says the famous lines that he's my son, that's he's my family. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innahu laysa min ahlik, he's not from your family. The family is the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a proverbial sense, metaphorically. It's the people of God, they are your family. So don't ask about these things. The Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam seeks tawbah for Allah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we move on to the story of Sayyidina Hud alayhi salatu wasalam. That these are again people who worship other than Allah. It's always shit. And the Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam again says, I don't, I don't expect anything from you. Seek forgiveness from your Lord. Turn back to him. If you do, then all the rains will come. He will give you wealth. 
He will give you power. All of these things, if you have belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you victory. And they said, you haven't come with any signs, and we're not going to leave our gods, and we don't believe in you. And, and he says, I have nothing to do with your gods. And then he says, all my reliance is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He controls everything. The animals and all of creation is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and then they, they, the, the punishment, again, if you deny, the punishment will inevitably come. Once you deny the clear miracle, the punishment is inevitable. So he saved everybody. We only saved Hud, sorry, and his and the people who believed with him and everybody else. They were saved from this. They, I mean, all of these people were saved from this very severe and harsh punishment. And these were Ad who'd rejected everything and they disobeyed the Prophet and um, and then every they'll be just followed with curses in this life and the hereafter. They'd be disbelieved and this series there are curses for the 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 Qawm of Hud alayhi salatu wasalam. Next is the story of Salih. These are stories of prophets. Salih, Sayyidina Salih comes to the people of Thamud and these are very powerful people who've been given incredible dominion over the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, seek forgiveness for all of the sins you commit. Um and then they're saying, you know, you were somebody who we had a lot of hope in. We believed in you. We had a lot of hope that you were going to achieve great things. And now you want to stop us from worshipping our gods. And then he, they say again, um, I, mercy, I have the signs. Who's going to save you? Who's going to save me um, if I disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then they have the she camel. And this incredible she camel, the, the, the miracle that Sayyidina Salih alayhi salatu wasalam is given. And then they attack the she camel. And then after that, they have three days and the punishment is going to come. And then the punishment comes and they're destroyed as well. Um, and these are all like, a lot of this is just solace for the Prophet wasallam that when people reject the miracles and the signs, inevitably the punishment is going to come. And so they're destroyed as well. Then the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is the story of uh, when the angels come and they give him glad tidings that he's going to have a son. Um because they've come to um, meet the people of Lut alayhi salatu wasalam and the, the wife starts to laugh uh, his wife فضحكت, بإسحاق, and she has a son called Ishaq and some say the meaning of Ishaq is from the Hebrew of Idhaq uh, which means to make laugh because she laughed when she was given news that this son was going to be born and then they say how how are we going to have a child if you know I'm old and my wife's old and um, they say, how can you be, don't be astonished by the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is all his mercy upon the Ahlul Bayt. And then Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Um, then after that is the story of Sayyidina Lut alayhi salatu was salam. Um, and so these are people. And so Sayyidina Lut alayhi salatu was salam, the sin of his people is that they would go and engage in sodomy with men. A'udhu billah min thalik. And so Sayyidina Lut alayhi salam, when he sees the angels come, he's incredibly distressed by this. And then they come seeking. Uh, you know, like uh, the people come running to him. He says, my daughters, you should have, if you wanted to get married, if you wanted to engage in sexual exploits, it's just this idea that he's saying, I have these daughters. You could have taken them instead. They were more pure for you than the eventually what you ended up doing, which was a heinous, heinous, disgusting deed. And don't, and so because, um, sorry, this is it. They come running to go take advantage of the angels because see these beautiful men and they want to take advantage of them. He's saying, my daughters instead. Um, and he said, is there not a man of intellect among you? Um, and so then they say, we're going to seek refuge. Um, he's saying that, you know, if only I had the strength to take refuge. And then they say, we are just prophets of God. We have come. With you, you have to leave with your family in the night. They will be afflicted with what they are going to be afflicted with. And it's going to happen in the morning. And the morning, the morning is very close. And then eventually the earth was turned upside down and they were destroyed with this. Uh, just everything was thrown on them, these rocks and things. And they were destroyed. Then Sayyidina Sha'ib, والسلام, his story, all of these prophets, a lot of the misdeeds that people carried out are misdeeds we see in the age. In, the, in a sense, we're like in the, the age of the great Prophet wasallam. But all of the sins of the previous prophets or the people of the previous prophets have been manifest in the age we live in, which is very, very terrifying it, with knowing that all the punishments that are possible. And then you have Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salatu wasalam and his people. And they're, they're, like we mentioned before, it's financial impropriety. Ya qawmi uful kayla wal mizana bil qist. You know, do everything with justice. Use the scales with justice. And they say to Shu'aib alayhi salatu, very famous verse, قَالُوا يَا شُعَيْبُ وَصَلَاتُكَ تَأْمُرُكَ 
Because they're very secular people. They don't like this idea that God is interfering in their lives. They say, Oh Shu'aib, is your prayer commanding you to make tell us to abandon what our forefathers have worshipped or to do in our wealth as we please? Like, why is it, what's this prayer that you bring? Your prayer is causing this impact, which is why the prayer should transcend the room in which it is prayed. The prayer should transcend the masjid. The prayer should transcend the house in which, is it pray, in which it is prayed because Islam is not a secular religion that coops religion up in this small little enclave. Everything has to be, has, a, has to have an effect on the greater society. Um, and saying that saying that, uh, Shu'aib alayhi salatu wasalam, who's a later prophet, is now making mention of the prophets who came before. Um, again, I have guidance. I've been brought these things. I just want good for you. Alayhi tawakkaltu ilayhi unib. I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to be afflicted by the punishment of Nuh and Hud and, and Salih alayhi salatu wasalam's people and even the people of Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. So turn back to Allah before the punishment comes. And they say, we don't even, we don't understand what you're saying. We see you as a, you're a very weak guy. Like your, your people are weak. You're weak. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that you had a tribe, we would have, we would have stoned you to death by now. And then he says, you know, that um, is my, is my, do you have more love for my tribe than you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Forget my tribe. It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then eventually the punishment came to them and Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salatu wasalam and the people alongside him were saved and everybody else was caught in the sayha that came and afflicted them. Um, and the, so then the story comes of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is, if I just check, this is the final story of the surah, and the surah is coming to a close here. That we said Musa with the signs and the clear, clear signs uh, to Fir'aun and his people, and they decided to follow, follow the Pharaoh instead. Um, and then again, they're going to be, have these incredible punishments, and they have just, they, we didn't oppress them, they oppressed themselves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out some sort of laws. Uh, these are some stories of nations that preceded. Um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the first thing is they all oppressed themselves. They called on gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, this is how we, this is how the punishment afflicts people like that. In akhdahu alimun shadeed. This is a very, very, very painful punishment. This is all a sign, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who fear the punishment of the day of judgment, the day where the gathering will happen, a day to be witnessed. The day will not be delayed. It's all of these signs. What happens? If you deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're going to be wretched in the fire. Um, you're going to stay in there for as long as the heavens and the earth are there, except when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Um, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just giving the law. This is the, the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those who are righteous, then they will have an incredible time of eternity in the garden of paradise. Again, we come back to Sayyidina Musa, alayhi salatu wa salam. And then um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is told that you have to stay firm. And we're going to talk about this verse later. Um, establish the prayer and then there's just this closing advice is given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the prophets uh, the stories of the prophets and the surah finishes rusul. we gave you all of these stories of the prophets to solidify your heart and this guidance and truth and and, and, and reminders for the believers um, and then the surah finishes okay so that's the end of surah Hud our next surah which is we're going to touch on it today very briefly um, is the story of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam and the Qur'an starts off this surah by saying نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنُ الْقَصَصِ We're going to narrate you the greatest of stories. It's a story for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam and the affliction and hardship he's going to face from his own family and then you can all see all these parallels between the life of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam and the life of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wasalam and Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam's story is like the story of redemption and liberation and mercy and everything at the end is always going to be all right and it's a beautiful story that whenever anybody should go to, go through any hardship they should remember the the, the difficulty that felt by Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts this story with the first thing that happens is the dream Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam sees this dream he's the son of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam a great prophet the son of Ishaq the son of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and he sees a dream. He tells his father, I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon and they're, worship, they're bowing down to me. He says, don't tell this dream to your brothers because they're already jealous of you. And they're gonna, the, the shaitan is going to incite them and they're going to do horrible things. And you have been given this gift. And then afterwards, um, the, the brothers are already very, they, they find out about the dream. And... Um, then Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, the brothers say that we're, we're, why, why does our father love Yusuf and Binyamin more than us? Binyamin is the brother of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. 
So they decide that they need to get rid of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. That maybe if they get rid of him, then their father will be alone for them. So they decide they're going to either kill him or they're going to throw him, uh, fling him into a far-flung land. And then they decide, no, we're not going to kill him. We're going to um, throw him into the depths of the well. And maybe some people will pick him up. They say, why don't you trust us with Yusuf alayhi salam? Obviously he doesn't trust them because they, they have bad intent. They say, we're going to take him out to play. And he says, I don't trust you. I'm scared a wolf will eat him. And this gives them ideas. They think, ah, then maybe we can use this as an excuse. They say, how can a wolf eat him when we're here with him? But anyways, they take Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. And then they come back to their father and they're weeping. And they're saying, oh, he's, he's very, very sad. We, were, we left Yusuf with our, with our uh, luggage. And then the wolf ate him. وَجَاءُوا عَلَىٰ قَمِيسِ بِدَ مِنْ كَذِبْ They came, they came upon their qamis with false blood. It's a very interesting wording the Qur'an uses here. The point is the false blood. The qamis already stands out as a lie. Everything's a lie. The Qur'an is telling us. That's what the, the ayah is telling us. Um, but saying that, and he's saying that Ya'qub alayhi salatu wasalam knows that they're lying. But ultimately saying that Yusuf alayhi salam is picked up from the well. He's sold into slavery in Egypt, but he ends up at the house of Potiphar, who's the Aziz of Misr, and they say he was some sort of military um, minister. He was a very important man in the government of Egypt. Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam ends up as a slave in his house, and he's told, Aknimi Mathwahu, his wife is told that you need to honor him, honor his uh, living space, meaning that if you're honoring his living space, you are honoring everything about him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ghalibun ala amri. Allah was always so powerful over his affair, keeping an eye on Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. That when he reached an age, um, a good age of adulthood, of maturity, we gave him knowledge and wisdom. And this is how we reward people. And then the seduction of the Zulaikha, of the wife of Potiphar. And Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam resists and she locks the doors and he seeks refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately he escapes and he runs. And then she rips the cloth from his back. Um, and then she starts to accuse him and says, he tried to seduce me. And then the man from the family says, no, we need to check. And they check and they find out and if it's done from the back, then it's um, he's a liar and he tried to rape her or something. Or if it's done from the front, then she's lying. And ultimately they found out it was ripped. Sorry, if it's done from the front, she's resisting. If it's done from the back, then he's the one who was initiating. Okay, I'm confusing myself. If it's done from the front, then she's telling the truth and he's the liar. And if it's done from the back, then he's telling the truth and she's a liar. And they find that it's done from the back, meaning that he's running away. And she grabs from the back and rips. And so this is the deception of, of uh, the wife of Potiphar. And she, Yusuf والسلام, is told by the, the Aziz, you just need to forgive her and let her go. She messed up. But the word starts to spread in the town. The, the Potiphar's wife was trying to seduce the slave boy from Canaan. And so she gets very, very embarrassed. So she calls the women. And all of the women see the beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, And they cut their hands. Like everybody knows, you can read the Waqatta um, Anaidiyahunna. And then she's saying, you blame me for this. Look at this. Look how amazing and how beautiful and how, how perfect this young man is. Um, she, and then they all c c conspire to say, you need to engage in this act. And he says, I, I don't want to. And he calls on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, prison is more beloved to me than what they, what they call me to. If you don't save me, I don't know what's going to happen to me. You have to save me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts his dua and he's sent to prison. And then he enters the prison and there's two young men that enter the prison with him. And one of them says, I see myself. They have these dreams. And then they ask for the interpretation of the dreams. And he says, before I tell you the interpretation of the dreams, I need to give you guidance. And he teaches them about the religion of uh, Sayyidina uh, Ya'qub and Ibrahim and Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you should believe arbabu mutafarriqun. Should you believe in multiple gods or just one god? And then all these things you worship, they're just names. They don't have any reality. These are just fake and idols. These are just idols. And then he gives them the interpretation of the dream. And then they hear the news that the king has had a dream about the seven fat cows who are being eaten by the seven skinny cows and the seven dry uh, ears of corn and the seven uh, healthy ones. And he wants the answer of the dream. And people say these are just dreams. They don't mean anything. And then Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam is summoned or he's asked. Um, because um, the young man who was saved, because the dream, the original two young men, one of them ends up in the court of the king. Anyways, and then said the Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam interprets the dream. Um, and um, he said, he tells the man that when you go back, tell them about me. And um, the, the king eventually, it's this long story, you have to, uh, going through every verse, verse will take a while. Um, but eventually the king calls um, 
for Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, but Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam wants his innocent to be proven. And he says, I will not go back until all of the women who cut their hands or accuse me of everything, they, it has to be found that everything they said was a lie. He wants to come out exonerated and innocent. Allahumma salli alayhi wasalam, Muhammad Rira, I apologize. <clears throat> Anyways, at the end, the women admit that it was all their ploy, it was their attempt at seduction, and ultimately they were liars. And Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam was truthful. And this is the first victory of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. These women came, they lied about him, he took it on the chin, he chose prison over disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and engaging in whatever the wives wanted him to engage in. And ultimately, ultimately he was successful, because he was only exonerated and released from the prison after his name was cleared. And so just some of the uh, quick lessons that we can take from this, what reading we did today. The Qur'an talks about the proofs and the challenges of the mushrikun. If you read that section, there's a whole idea of what they, they're causing a lot of problems to the Prophet ﷺ. Then the stories of the Prophets that we looked at. And these are amazing stories and everybody should read Surah Hud. Dreams and the interpretation of dreams, the envy of brothers. The seduction of women, the murawada that everybody should be careful with, especially in the age we live in, in a hypersexualized society. And then the escape from the prison that can only be done after exoneration and wisdom and knowledge and always being true to your principles throughout. Today's verse we're going to look at is verse 112 of uh, Surah Hud, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they say this is the verse when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Surah Hud made his hair white, this was the verse. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ Be steadfast as you are commanded. Along with those who turn in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Do not transgress Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever watchful of what you are doing And say this is the idea of steadfastness You have to be steadfast in the good you do It's not good enough to do it for a week or half an hour or an hour Your life has to be spent just engaged in steadfastness You're doing the, 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 the great man, the miraculous man Is not he who does 500 Qur'ans in one Ramadan or something It's the man who does Qur'an every Ramadan for 40 years It's the consistency that makes greatness And that's what the Prophet wasallam is being told Just to remain steadfast, to remain patient To remain doing what you have been asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do And this is what gave trepidation to the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And ultimately caused his noble hair sallallahu alayhi wa sallam To turn white we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month of patience and steadfastness To keep us patient and steadfast Subhanakallahumma bihamdikun ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfirukun atubu ilaha